It's 7 p.m. Tuesday, August 7th, here in Seoul. Coming up on News Center tonight. It's official. Japan promulgates an amended decree that removes South Korea from its white list of preferred trading partners. But Japan doesn't specify items that require long procedure of individual export approval, stirring speculations on its motive. President Moon Jae-in says Japan's export curbs can be an opportunity for South Korea to leapfrog Japan's economy by raising the competitiveness of local firms. He vows to help this process during a visit to a Korean tech manufacturer near Seoul. The nation's top finance officials vow to take preemptive measures to stabilize financial markets, which are under threat from what they call temporary risks. The pledge comes after an emergency meeting aimed at tackling a volatile market. And North Korea says that what it fired yesterday were its new tactical guided missiles. Leader Kim Jong-un, who oversaw the launches, says they were a warning against joint South Korea-US military drills. New Center begins now. Good evening and welcome to Arirang News Center live from Seoul. I'm Han Daun. And I'm Noa Dam. Thank you for joining us this evening. Our top story tonight Japan has announced the details of the new regulations that will take effect later this month when Korea is taken off Japan's so called white list of trading partners. But unlike expected, it did not specify which items will be subject to individual export approval as of August 28th when the new regulations are set to take effect. Our Hong Yu tells us more. Japan's detailed enforcement of export regulations includes a decision last Friday to exclude South Korea from the so-called white list of preferential trading partners. These new regulations will come into effect after 21 days. This means that some items out of the 1,100 strategic materials that can be used for military purposes will not benefit from a simplified inspection process. And non-regulated items could also be subject to separate approval and will have to go through a long process of export approval by Japan's trade ministry, should Japan consider that they could be used to make weapons. High-purity hydrogen fluoride, photoresist and fluorine polyamide, the three semiconductor and display materials under Japan's export restrictions fall under this category. Japan also announced a new system of classifying trade partners into groups A to D. Under the new system, countries included on the white list will be classified into group A, in which Japan's regulated items benefit from a separate screening exemption if they get approval from Japan's trade ministry once every three years. South Korea is categorized into group B and will have to go through a more difficult process of export approval. But even for countries in Group B, some items get special general comprehensive authorization so they can benefit from a screening exemption. Special general comprehensive authorization is given to Japanese companies selected by the Japanese government for their approved export management. Countries categorized into Group D are those that Japan's trade ministry judges to have low credibility like North Korea and Iraq. Hong Yu, Arirang News. Korean firms were bracing for tougher export restrictions, but at least for now, the damages are likely to be limited as Japan hasn't designated any additional items that require individual export approval. But as our Lee min Sun reports, Korea is not letting its guard down. Japan's detailed regulations released on Wednesday for the enforcement of taking South Korea off the white list did not include additional goods subject to tougher export regulations. Seoul had thought that Tokyo might add more items to the list of goods that are strictly regulated when exported to South Korea. Japan had previously declared that it would impose tougher regulations on three key materials used for making semiconductors and displays in early July. Japan already put regulations on three key materials for semiconductors and excluded South Korea from the list of preferred trading partners. If Japan puts regulations on additional items, then it will make the situation worse. It appears that Japan didn't want the burden of creating more tension, with the U.S. trying to mediate the situation, the ongoing boycott movements in Korea, 
and the possible influence on the global and local economy. However, some worry that the ambiguous terms used in the detailed regulation may give room for Japan to put other products on the list of goods subject to tougher regulations anytime they want in the future. Once the goods are included on the list, the Japanese government can prolong the approval process or reject the export request from South Korean companies. South Korea's trade official said that it's hard to say whether Japan has refrained from expanding the current measures and that they need to wait and see whether Japan will take any further related measures. Lee min Sun, Arirang News. President Moon Jae-in says Japan's export measures could end up being a silver lining for Korean businesses, giving them the chance to strengthen their parts and materials industries. He also emphasized the need to keep developing technology during his visit to a promising Korean company that successfully reduced its reliance on Japan. Her Park Ki-jun has more. Technology feeds the country. This was the key message by President Moon Jae-in on Wednesday during his first on-site visit to a firm since Japan started taking measures to tighten regulations on its exports to South Korea. Emphasizing the importance of self-made technology, he said that was what helped transform Korea from a colony into a developed country. The company he visited was SVB Tech in the city of Kimpo, west of Seoul. SVB Tech is the first South Korean company to successfully develop a key part in robotics, harmonic decelerators. Harmonic decelerators used to be imported mostly from Japan, making them highly vulnerable to Japan's recent move to exclude South Korea from its whitelist. But with a great amount of time and investment, SVB managed to free itself from reliance on Japan. President Moon pointed to the firm as a strong example that the imminent difficulties could be a positive turning point, especially for smaller businesses. To ensure Korean firms boost their capabilities, the president promised his government's full support. Pointing out that South Korea has the highest R&D expenditure to GDP ratio in the world, President Moon called for increased distribution of R&D to smaller companies to help enhance their competitiveness in parts and materials. He also instructed the Ministry of Science and ICT to better assist them in supplying their technology and products to major companies. Park Ki-jun, Airang News. Senior finance officials, including the heads of South Korea's finance ministry and central bank, held an urgent meeting for the first time in two years this morning to discuss how to stabilize markets against, quote, temporary risks. Our Won jong hwan reports. Finance Minister Hong nam Gi and Bank of Korea Governor Lee ji held an urgent meeting with other senior finance officials on Wednesday morning to discuss Japan's export curbs and the U.S. decision to label China as a currency manipulator. It is the first time the heads of the finance ministry and the central bank have met since the aftermath of North Korea's sixth nuclear test some two years ago. During Wednesday morning's meeting, South Korea's finance minister vowed to take preemptive measures to stabilize the country's financial and foreign exchange markets. Hong said the increased volatility in the domestic market was the result of short-term risks that happened to overlap, and insisted that he will cope with such issues as swiftly and sternly as possible. On top of around-the-clock monitoring, the minister vowed to take measures to stabilize the markets according to the finance ministry's contingency plan. Under the contingency plan that has already been devised, we will take swift and bold steps through all available means such as stock market stabilization measures and easing regulations on buybacks and short sellings at a suitable time. 
And regarding Japan's export curbs against South Korea, he said he will provide full support to reduce any sudden damage. We will strongly urge Japan to promptly withdraw its improper measures against South Korea and will provide support to companies to minimize the short-term damage, including decisive measures to help companies become less dependent on Japan. And BOK Governor Yi stressed the need to curb volatility in the foreign exchange market. As now is when we must focus on financial and foreign exchange market stabilization, the Bank of Korea will continue its market stabilization efforts while closely cooperating with the government. He stressed that maintaining the country's economic credibility is more important than anything else, and that the central bank and the government will pull their wisdom to manage Korea's economy to this end. Won Jong-hwan, Arirang News. Japan seems to be gearing up for a stronger defense against South Korea's claims that Tokyo's export curbs are unfair and politically motivated. South Korea has been garnering more global support over its stance, but Japan is trying to shift that sentiment in its favor. Lee ji explains. Japan's Kuro News Agency says Tokyo plans to start officially promoting its view to the international society that its trade restrictions on South Korea are not retaliation for Seoul's court ruling on forced labor. Citing numerous government officials, the agency reported Tuesday that Japan will be telling other countries that its export controls are a security management issue, an attempt to counter Seoul's view that the measures are unfair and political. According to Kyoto, Seoul's efforts to persuade the international community continue, including an appeal at the World Trade Organization, and the Japanese government is trying to get the upper hand. This includes seeking support at bilateral talks and multilateral conferences, and especially, Kyoto says, working in various ways to win the support of the United States. But despite these efforts, the logic of Japan's claims about the cause of the row seems to break down in remarks from Prime Minister Shinzo Abe himself. Japan argues that its past use of Koreans for forced labor was resolved in 1965, while South Korea's Supreme Court says that agreement doesn't take away the individual right to reparations. At a news conference Tuesday, Abe said that in the current situation, the most important thing is the need for South Korea to abide by the agreement and that the biggest issue between the two is trust. Seoul's foreign ministry pointed out that Abe's remarks show that the source of the trade row is indeed the forced labor ruling and thus the trade restrictions are retaliatory. Japan's been continuously changing its reason for restricting exports to Seoul, from lack of trust, security concerns related to North Korea, to the current lack of a management system for sensitive goods. But the international community already knows that this is retaliation, and thus Japan's efforts to persuade other countries won't be so effective. Still, the professor says Hull must continue to counter every one of Japan's excuses and share its reasoning with the international community. He said support from international meetings will put great pressure on Japan and will eventually force them to find an exit plan. Lee ji Arirang News. Now, as the bilateral tensions brew between South Korea and Japan, a number of commentaries from global think tanks and publications are saying Japan's unilateral trade curbs on Korea are only tarnishing the Abe administration's global reputation. Oh Soo-young has more. By starting a trade war with South Korea, Japan is risking its long-term interests and its carefully crafted reputation. That's according to commentaries on Tuesday by various global analysts. An article in foreign policy magazine highlights the political and economic ramifications of Japan's decision. It says the Abe administration seems unprepared for what it calls the impending blowback. The article says Japan's use of trade regulations for politics will make it unreliable and prompt other global businesses to switch to suppliers they feel they can depend on. The article also notes that Japanese firms have already seen revenues from South Korea fall by double-digit percentages in retail and tourism, as South Korean consumers and tourists boycott Japanese goods and travel to the country. The article says Tokyo started a trade war that it wasn't ready to fight, and notes that Shinzo Abe's unreadiness to compromise on bilateral sticking points makes Tokyo's actions look extreme. 
another article published by the US-based Center for Strategic and International Studies, says Japan's image as an economic leader has been tarnished. Tokyo has undermined its earlier endorsements of global trade links and economic diplomacy, thereby also diminishing Seoul's support for such initiatives in trade, infrastructure and digital laws. The article urges the two sides to engage in constructive working-level talks and not to escalate their dispute. As for the export controls, it recommends that Japan suspend them. Oseyang Arirang News. With Japan promulgating its revised bill removing South Korea from its trade whitelist, rival political parties here in Korea were united in calling for efforts to find a breakthrough. But they differed over how to handle Tokyo's trade retaliation. Kim Min-ji reports. South Korea's ruling Democratic Party says they will win the trade dispute with Japan. Following Tokyo's promulgation of a bill stripping Seoul of preferential treatment and export procedures, the ruling party said that all efforts will be directed at minimizing the fallout on local firms and helping boost their competitiveness to lessen their reliance on Japan. The party's leadership, though, cautioned of taking an extreme approach after some party lawmakers suggested scrapping the joint military intel sharing pact, banning travel to Tokyo, and even considered a boycott of the 2020 Olympics. The main opposition Liberty Korea Party called on the Moon Jae-in administration to overhaul its security, diplomatic and economic policies. They also slammed President Moon Jae-in's remarks stressing the importance of economic cooperation with North Korea as a means to bolster the economy and catch up with Japan, saying that it lacks reality, especially after Pyongyang's continued provocations. Although rival parties differ over how to deal with Japan's trade provocations, they are united on the need to swiftly advance the country's economic ecosystem to turn this crisis into an opportunity. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. A special photo exhibition opened at the South Korean parliament today displaying evidence of Japan's wartime atrocities. Of course, it's connected to the reasons Japan is targeting the Korean economy. Our Kim mo was there and files this report. The ruling Democratic Party's Special Committee on the Japanese Economic Aggression opened a photo exhibition on Wednesday depicting Japan's past wartime atrocities. Japan denies it, but South Korea says Tokyo's latest economic restrictions are an act of retaliation for decisions last year by the Supreme Court in Seoul holding Japanese companies liable for wartime forced labor. In remarks opening the exhibition, Democratic Party Chairman Lee Hye-chan condemned the Japanese government's latest measures and said the Abe administration is once again denying the past. The forced labor and comfort women issues are more than a row between Seoul and Tokyo. It is about Japan's understanding of humanity and of universal human rights. Japanese politicians in the past had a sense of conscience, but the Abe administration is denying the past and infringing on freedom of expression. The three-day exhibition features an array of old photos and vivid interviews donated by the so-called comfort women and the victims of forced labor under Japan during World War II. Visitors attach chrysanthemums to the photos as a symbol to honor the victims ahead of the National Memorial Day for the Comfort Women, which falls on August 14th. Organizers say they hope the exhibition would remind people of the pain of the past, help them sympathize with the Koreans who suffered, and heal the wounds of the victims. Kim Mo-gyun, Arirang News. Several anti-Japan rallies took place today near the Japanese embassy in Seoul. The weekly Wednesday rally for the so-called comfort women was held as usual and called for Tokyo to officially apologize and compensate the Korean women it sexually enslaved. The rally organizers refer to Japan's recent removal of a comfort woman statue from a public art exhibition and called on Japan to admit it to its wartime wrongdoings. A union representing government workers also held a protest and urged Japan to accept South Korea's court ruling that ordered Japanese companies to compensate the Korean people used for forced labor during Japan's colonial rule. In other news, North Korea has confirmed that it tested a new type of tactical guided missile yesterday and that leader Kim Jong-un was on site to oversee the launch. Releasing a report and photos of Tuesday's missile test, Pyongyang state media said two tactical guided missiles were fired from the western part of the territory, flew across North Korea and successfully hit the targeted islet in the East Sea. Kim Jong-un reportedly said this would be an adequate warning to the ongoing joint military exercises between Seoul and Washington. 
The report called it an intended demonstration of force. The projectiles, the projectiles fired on Tuesday are said to be the same as the ones tested on July 25th. But while the North called it a tactical guided weapon back then, this time the North said it was a tactical guided missile. Launched for the first time in the north's western county of Kwail, what the north calls new tactical guided missiles flew some 400 kilometers, putting a couple of key South Korean military bases in range. The move is being seen as a way to show off its missile capabilities. Oh Jung-hee tells us more. This year, North Korea has conducted six test launches of short-range projectiles, two in early May and four in the past two weeks. Among the recent four, two were test launches from a multiple rocket launcher, according to North Korean reports. Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff say they each flew 250 and 220 kilometers. The other two tests were of tactical guided missiles. Believed to be similar to Russia's Iskander-class ballistic missiles, they each flew 600 and 450 kilometers. What draws attention is the latest launch. The two projectiles, which are seen by the South Korean military as a new type of short-range ballistic missiles, cut across North Korea from west to east, flying over the capital city of Pyongyang. Pundits say the regime showed how confident it is about its missile capabilities, while showing how feasible it is for the regime to target most parts of South Korea's territory. The latest launch flew 450 kilometers, located roughly 300 kilometers away from the test site in Kwaye, is South Korea's Cheongju Air Base, where four F-35A stealth fighter jets are stationed. And the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD, is stationed in Songju, about 400 kilometers away. It is the first time that the North fired missiles from the western county of Kwaye. Military authorities say this is to show that the North can fire missiles anywhere using a transporter erector launcher, making it harder to detect. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. South Korea's main stock index, the Kospi, closed lower for a sixth straight session on Wednesday, and lingering worries over the U.S.-China trade dispute, with China's central bank fixing its yuan at a new 11-year low. The Kospi fell 0.4% in 1909, keeping near its three-and-a-half-year low. The tech-heavy Kosdaq, however, continued to recover from its decline on Monday, adding almost 2.4% to close at just under 565. South Korea's state-run think tank has described the country's economy as stagnant for a fifth month in a row. Downside risks, it said, are growing due to Japan's export restrictions on South Korea and escalating tensions between the U.S. and China. In the economic trend report for August, the Korea Development Institute said production in all industries fell by 1.1 percent in June from the previous year. Retail sales edged up 1.2 percent in June from a year ago, but the growth was lower than the month before. The KDI said investment and exports were also sluggish, particularly in semiconductors. In the meantime, economists at the think tank put the country's growth outlook this year at 2 percent, down 0.2 percentage points from the projection in April. In the latter half of this year, South Korean companies and workers are seeing some changes in terms of labor law. That'll include the 52-hour work week limit applying to more companies, a broader ban on harassment in workplace, and a bigger and longer unemployment benefit. Our Yoon Jung-min has a story. More industries were included in the mandatory 52-hour maximum work week system from July. 21 industries had originally been granted a one-year grace period, but now all of those industries have to abide by the maximum workweek rule. Broadcasters, financial services, bus services, accommodation and the postal service are among the industries that now can't force employees to work excessive hours. If they violate the law, they will be first given a chance to fix the violation. If they don't take heed, company owners could potentially face up to two years in prison or be fined up to 17,000 U.S. dollars. The law now affects more than 1,000 additional companies and over 1 million workers in those industries. 
But some are raising doubts about whether these industries can strictly observe the law due to their notoriously long work hours. Also, from this October, people who have lost their jobs will get a higher unemployment allowance. According to the revised Employment Insurance Act, the allowance will be raised to 60% of the average wage, up from the previous 50%. Also, the revision raises the payment period by 30 days. Now, people can receive the allowance for 270 days or around 9 months. In July, a new law came into effect to prevent harassment in the workplace. If workers use their superior status or power to cause physical or mental suffering to other employees, they can be reported to the company's owners. Once a case is reported, employers must immediately launch an investigation and take proper action, such as separating victims from perpetrators in the workplace. If they fail to follow the rule, they may face a prison term of up to three years or be fined by up to $25,000. But some say it could be difficult for employees to report the case if employers are the ones causing the problem and they are asking the government to fix the problem. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. The top diplomats of South Korea, China and Japan will reportedly meet in Beijing within this month. Japan's public broadcaster NHK says Seoul's Kang Kyung-hwa, Beijing's Wang Yi and Tokyo's Tadakono will meet on the 21st. It says the main agenda will be Japan's export controls on Seoul and North Korea's missile launches. If realized, the trilateral meeting will be the first in three years. NHK reports separate bilateral talks are also scheduled. South Korea will add seven more hiking trails along the demilitarized zone by next year. Culture Minister Park Yang-woo announced the new trails today, as well as 10 other DMZ tourist attractions. Currently, there are three DMZ peace trails open in Gosong, Choron and Paju. The locations for the new trails will include Kimpo and Yeoncheon in Gyeonggi-do province, as well as Hwacheon and Yanggu in Gangwon-do province. Brazil's National Institute for Space Research says deforestation in Brazil increased by almost 300% last month compared to the previous year. Around 3,200 square kilometers of the Amazon rainforest was destroyed in July, an area five times bigger than Seoul. It's also an 88% increase from the deforestation of the previous month. Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, claims the research is inaccurate and damaging to Brazil's image. The main throne hall of Gyeongbokgung Palace will be open to the public for the first time starting August 21st. Kim jong jeon was used for important royal ceremonies and the reception of foreign envoys during the Joseon dynasty. Listed as one of South Korea's national treasures, the interior of the hall will be open to the public from Wednesday through Saturday until September 21st. Anyone over the age of 13 can apply for the twice-a-day tour for free on the palace's website. That has been your three-minute news flash. It is that time now where we take a look at some of Arirang's digital media content. And today we have another episode of Coriator where we, uh, foreigners share their love for Korea. Hi. Hi. Ray. And Tina. So what are we going to cook for today's dinner? I'm going to cook haejintang, which is kind of samgyetang, Korean chicken soup. We add more seafood to get better taste. Mm, is it easy to cook? Super easy. Oh. Let's get started. So the basic of samgyetang is just making a chicken based soup but if you want to make haejintang you start adding up some uh, seafood what you can get 
most of Korean people prefer to put octopus, uh, clams, or abalone in Haitian tang, but I can only get octopus and shrimp, so I'm gonna add up here. How's the meat? It's delicious. It's, it's a little bit mild to me, but uh, it with salt makes a really perfect combination. <laughs> Do you feel healthier? Healthier? <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Typhoon Francisco didn't hit the peninsula as hard as many expected, but it brought more than 200 millimeters of heavy rain to Kangwondo province. Yes, and as for the capital, the tropical storm actually helped lower the mercury a couple of notches. For more details, let's connect to our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle. Good evening, guys. Now, so it turned out to be a mild day today, under 30 degrees Celsius. But the rainstorm couldn't completely relieve the heat, especially for the southern regions, as it's still under the heat wave alerts. The atmosphere remains very unstable, so we'll be receiving plenty of isolated and sporadic showers of between 10 to 70 millimeters on Thursday. And meanwhile, the mercury is expected to be on the rise until this weekend. The country will have to endure more tropical nights. On Thursday morning, the daily low will hover around 25 degrees Celsius. By lunchtime tomorrow, source daytime high will be back at 33 degrees Celsius with similar readings in various southern cities such as Gwangju and Daegu. The Korea Meteorological Administration expects Typhoon Lakima to pass Taipei on Friday and head northwest towards Shanghai by this weekend. But if the typhoon takes the northeastern direction, there is a possibility that it will impact the Korean Peninsula. And we should know more on this path, strength and intensity of the storm later this week. I'll leave you with weather conditions around the world. That will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thank you as always for watching. News in Depth is next.